and welcome to everyone. We're being recorded. Um, thanks, Kat, and welcome to everyone here and anyone who's watching on the Facebook uh, live stream. I'm Dan Gordon. I work at a mission-driven education consulting group in, based in Washington, D.C. called Education Council. We are proud partners um, with ASA on a number of projects, including the one that brought us here today, um, which <clears throat> is um, a, about a, an ongoing body of work that we've been doing with ASA to support ASA members in making um, an effective and equitable recovery uh, from the COVID pandemic. If you could advance the slide, Emily. Um, the work that we've been doing, and I'm mostly just gonna give a quick introduction uh, and then turn it over to Emily and our great um, district leader guests. Um, but the essential question that we've been pursuing with this project is on the screen before you. The question is how can districts um, use ESSER funds and, and all other available resources, because we know that you all are bringing more than just your ESSER funds, but those, those pose um, specific challenges and opportunities um, to, to using well. How can we use available resources to meet your immediate needs, unprecedented significant needs, and at the same time, redesign towards something better, something more aspirational. Here, we've used the more the student-centered, equity-focused and future-driven approach as articulated by ASA's Learning 2025 framework. That's the image on the right. Um, some of you here may be even members of the Learning 2025 learning community, um, but it's sort of ASA's kind of um, North Star for where public education uh, can and should move. And part of what we're trying to do in supporting ASA members and others in making great use of these, um, of the, these uh, federal recovery funds is, um, is to try and think about using these as an opportunity to also work towards that. Um, through this project, we've done a bunch of different things, including creating resources, um, hosting webinars uh, is part of this, making the most of your ESSER funds series like today, um, and done various workshops with ASA members and cohorts. At the heart of our work have been four guiding principles um, that ASA members and talking to lots of ASA members and superintendents um, and other folks like friends at ERS, um, we think are, are the best things to keep in mind as district leaders, as you chart your way through the recovery and chart your paths and plans to use the federal recovery funds. I'm gonna quickly run through the, those four guiding principles. The first is related to that essential question. It's what we call plant seeds. You're gonna, you have a lot of holes that you have to fill and the federal recovery dollars are there and able to help you fill those holes. But what we hope is that as a guiding principle, as you fill the holes, you can also plant seeds for that future more aspirational vision of public education in your community um, that will bear fruit over time. The second guiding principle is to center equity in your work. And we think about this in two ways. Um, first of all, centering equity in the sense of allocating resources um, according to need. So making sure that those students and communities and schools that have the greatest needs are getting the resources they need um, to, to meet them. The second way we think about centering equity, hold on Emily, is, um, is taking this as an opportunity to revisit practices, policies, um, uh, um, mindsets that help contribute to or exacerbate um, disparities in your communities. Um, so how can, how can you take this as a moment to rethink old ways of doing things, uh, question some longstanding assumptions and chart a better course? The third guiding principle uh, also has two meanings. Uh, this is use and build knowledge. So on the front end, the using knowledge, uh, what we have in mind here is um, how can you take advantage of what we know about what works and for whom and under what circumstances as you decide how to spend these recovery dollars? So are you making evidence-based approaches? Um, what have you learned in the past that you can apply to your decisions now? And then the other part of this um, third guiding principle is building knowledge. So that may include you know, conducting actual formal evaluation so that you, you learn more about what's working and why, um, but it also could be engaging in ongoing continuous improvement. Um, what are you learning from your implementation that you can use to improve as you go? What did you learn from last summer's um, recovery uh, expansion of your summer programming that you could apply to next summers, things like that. And then the fourth and final one is about sustaining strategically. Um, as you all know, there, there's a challenge with these dollars in that they are not recurring line items in your budget, but they have a, uh, an end period. And so how can you be thinking from the beginning and in the, in where we are now in the middle and towards the end, about what you're gonna do when those funds um, expire. And that could mean, um, as Emily will, will talk about, keep finding ways to, to continue things that are being effective in helping your students um, and, and schools and teachers. Um, or it could be saying, there are there things that we've been doing for a long time that just simply aren't working and we should stop. 
or are there things that you invested dollars in that really were meant to be a temporary uh, surge in support as you, you came out of the recovery that were never intended and shouldn't necessarily um, be something that you try and sustain? So how can you be strategic about that upcoming um, uh, moment of get going over the cliff? Um, so those are the four guiding principles. Um, my colleague Ellie will put in the chat, if she hasn't already, uh, a link to the part of the ASA website that has all of the resources that we've built out um, in alignment, in thinking about how we can support district leaders in manifesting these principles. And as I think you'll hear today from Emily and Scott and Katie, um, the, the concept of doing a, a, a halftime review of your ESSER work is a really important way to manifest these principles. Uh, you know, are you, are you planting your, are, is the work that you're doing actually have you charting a course towards something more aspirational? How is, how is your effort to center equity in your plans going and do you need to tweak it? Obviously opportunities for continuous improvement in that third one. And then as you look towards the second half of the ESSER spend, how can you be thinking about sustainability? Um, so we're super excited about the content that'll come today. It's, it's very aligned with what we think is most important. Um, and we're really excited for you to hear from especially our district guests. So I'll turn it over to Emily and I'm excited for the conversation. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'll introduce myself in just a second, but as Dan said, we are so excited to have uh, Katie and Scott here with us today. Um, when asked to, to facilitate this webinar around uh, learning from this particular moment uh, in the ESSER timeline and uh, making strategic adjustments to plans uh, and being able to communicate really effectively about where you are in the process. It was a really clear choice uh, of systems to choose from, both because uh, their leader, their leadership teams have uh, lent into a strategic use of, of this ESSER opportunity, but also as individuals, Scott and Katie have uh, led really uh, thoughtful and strategic processes uh, through uh, their roles and in, in influencing their leadership teams. And so uh, really excited to, uh, have you both here, Scott and Katie? Thank you. Um, for for those of you not familiar with ERS, you can uh, read a little bit about our mission and our footprint here on this slide. Uh, my name is Emily Parfit. I'm a director, and my unique role over the last eighteen months has been facilitating a, a network of ESSER leads from what we're calling leading districts across the country. Um, we've grown over the last eighteen months. Uh, to be a cohort of almost 20 districts, uh, all of whom joined uh, intent on investing their ESSER dollars in ways that lead to better outcomes for students and in using the opportunity to change service delivery structures to better serve students in the long term. Um, so all of the learnings that we're bringing forward have really come out of uh, this, these conversations with those 18 to 20 districts. And the, the set of learnings we're hoping to share here with you all today um, are centered, uh, really, if you take one thing away, it's this uh, first objective around what we should be paying attention to and communicating in this particular moment. Um, we will make the case that those, th those things uh, are these three here. Um, the, the second objective is really just for you all to hear from Katie and Scott, how they and their systems uh, have taken this thoughtful approach to uh, managing their leadership team's engagement around the ESSER opportunity and what they've learned from that. And then we're hoping to land the plane in this hour on a couple of uh, key moves that you can make in this budget cycle uh, to optimize the ESSER opportunity. So with that lofty set of goals, I'll just keep us moving here. Um, this ESSER timeline slide uh, has been useful for a couple of districts in terms of communicating uh, the ESSER opportunity to their board. The timeline piece of it though is both short as we're all experiencing and, and somewhat amorphous. If any of you have read uh, the latest McKinsey article on ESSER, they kept referring to three budget cycles left to spend now on ESSER. And, and while that might be technically true, if we think this school year, next school year, and 24, 25, for, for those of us actually doing the work and, and managing teams to spend down the dollars, uh, this is really our last planning cycle to, to influence the, full, the, the footprint of ESSER over a full school year, uh, that 23, 24 school year. Um, so, 
yes, there's more time to make meaningful changes to SR strategy. We really want to emphasize uh, the urgency around decisions in this cycle. We have the next two summers and then potentially uh, some creative encumbering of dollars for the 24-25 school year. Um, but the the nuances of the timeline are important as we think about uh, what is most critical about the planning cycle uh, this year. In addition to the question of how much time is left, there are a couple of other narratives in the field that I think are important to acknowledge and uh, address as we think about our communication strategy uh, to know sort of what we're fighting upstream against. The first, if you look at national media, Washington Post, New York Times, Ed Week, you're gonna see headline after headline that districts uh, that are further ahead on spending have made better choices. Uh, and this conflating rate of spend with efficacy of spend is uh, really a flawed uh, perspective. There are many quick and easy ways to spend down ESSER. You could uh, take your ESSER dollars, divide by your number of FTE in the district and give everyone that size bonus. That's really quick. You're gonna have spent down all your ESSER funds, uh, but I'm not sure how strategic it is. And, and I think uh, the, thing, the, the moves that systems are making that are really uh, strategic and research backed and designed to move the needle on student learning sort of take the time they take to stand up uh, and, uh, and spend down. The second narrative uh, is that folks are uh, expecting uh, that we can demonstrate the success of our initiatives through regression analyses that isolate change in performance back to individual ESSER expenditures. And to the extent that you can do that now, great, but I would deeply question folks that are sort of pushing for that uh, in this moment. We are just getting started on the spend in, in many ways. And maybe if there are specific initiatives with very narrowly defined outcomes where uh, you know, you're, you've hired somebody to do a re-engagement strategy and you wanna see if, if more kids are coming to school on a daily basis, or if you have an academic intervention that is very time bound and with a well-defined control group, uh, maybe, but those things are likely only a small percentage of ESSER spend. And when you look at the whole picture, we're not there yet. So one more slide to make that point. Um, when we think about communicating impact of ESSER investments, um, we can think of a pyramid where the base represents what we can do for all initiatives. And the top of the pyramid represents what we can do for, for just a few of our investments. So starting at the bottom for all, we wanna be able uh, to show that we made research backed decisions about how to invest. Then for any initiatives that we were able you know, to get off the ground, uh, we wanna be able to show progress on implementation. So if research says that small group instruction for K2 literacy accelerates students' abilities to learn, then you know, we decided to hire reading interventionists focused on K2 reading, that's number one. Um, and so far we've hired say nine out of 10 or four out of 10. <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, that's number two. Did we, are we implementing the plans? And then let's try to get to a measure of quality of implementation. What does research say needs to be true about those small groups? They need to be two to six students, have rigorous curriculum, blocks of times that are roughly like 20 to 40 minutes, uh, three to five times a week. That's where data collection starts to get more uh, cumbersome uh, to get that kind of quality of implementation. And so we really only want to do that for our big bets uh, that are going to move student learning. Um, and then finally, for some small number of interventions, we may get to a place where we really want to know if the kids who were able to uh, receive that interventionist instruction um, outperformed students in schools where they weren't able to. Um, but again, the point here is like that's going to be a narrow set and it's going to be further down the line in terms of timeline. So what does that mean for our narrative arc in communicating with the public? Um, we think it looks something like this, uh, where these three middle blocks are those uh, aligned to those three priorities uh, we set up front, um, where we, we do wanna be showing uh, progress on implementation um, and fidelity. 
We also want to be showing adjustments. We're learning based on what we're seeing. If we've hired one out of our 10 interventionists, then I think we need to be shifting to plan B soon. Uh, and so we want to be uh, sharing that information transparently uh, and then making sure we are adjusting both on what we're seeing on what works, but then also changing needs. The context uh, has shifted dramatically and will continue to uh, over time. And then this last piece uh, that's really important is that we think it's time to start talking about approach to managing the fiscal cliff. It's not that we need to have the specific decisions about trade-offs, um, but we want to know uh, that we're how we're previewing reduction, like the the approach and the process and the decision-making criteria um, uh, for how we're going to manage that transition. So I think I've spoken enough. Um, I'm gonna uh, kick it over to Scott and Katie here in a second, but first just to introduce um, the, you know, how we think system leaders can get to a place where they have the information to support that narrative arc. Um, we've been promoting a, a halftime review, um, which we think have, uh, has helped systems uh, to collect that information. Um, our motto has been from the start that districts uh, who will be most successful with ESSER are the ones that improve the most over time, not the ones that had uh, the best plan from the start. And so really wanted to place an emphasis on this halftime moment to step back and reflect and adjust. We think there are sort of three phases to the halftime work. Uh, there is a data collection phase that the ease of which depends on how you set up uh, your tracking from the start. But either way, really important to get a sense of uh, spend and progress against your plan. The other really critical part of that first phase is understanding the, the student need context and making sure that you're looking at multiple measures of uh, student needs to inform uh, shifting uh, context uh, and plans. Then we wanna look at the equity, the sustainability pictures as Dan teed up in his priorities. Uh, the um, those two aspects, uh, we want to make sure that we are starting our thinking now to ensure that uh, at the end of it, we can look back and say uh, we invested equitably and sustainably. And we think these conversations land on on three basic insights. Um, there's reprogramming of dollars. Uh, there's continuous improvement of existing initiatives, and then there's shifts to uh, collaboration structures and um, namely sort of approach to spending down the dollars. So with that, this is the process that both Katie and Scott uh, led. Very curious um, to hear from both of you. And I think I'll, I'll kick it over to Katie first. When when you, you as a system decided to embark on this halftime review, what were the questions you were hoping to answer? What was the need that uh, instigated the halftime review process in your system? Thanks, Emily. Um, so in, in Charlotte Mech, we really looked at this, um, just like the name describes, as our halftime, right? Like our time to get, pull the team together in the locker room um, and really have a discussion around you know, how have we done so far? You know, what is that shared fact base um, based on our initiatives, how they're progressing, um, based on how they're progressing, how that um, will ultimately unfold for our students and for our kids. We also looked at this as our, our opportunity to think about any changes that we wanted to make. So we built our ESSER plans as the ESSER dollars came out um, with room for changes, knowing that there may be some unanticipated needs the landscape may change, the needs may change over time. Um, and uh, we also anticipated that we would be learning some things along the way, right? Um, learning what's working with specific initiatives, et cetera. And so we did look at this as an opportunity to just push pause for one second and say, what are some of the things that we need to um, kind of look at as we, as we go forward into this second half, right? And then the third piece um, is we really thought about this as the right time um, to specifically um, make sure all of our um, cabinet, all of our um, high level leadership in CMS um, was able to kind of name with these initiatives and, and specifically our larger initiatives, what are the things we're looking for in implementation based on the time, timelines that were set forward? 
What are the things we're looking for as leading indicators so that ultimately we can get to those outcomes that we were wanting um, and getting really clear on those and how we're measuring those over time so that we can intervene in places where we need to intervene and do so faster um, if there are things that need to change with a particular initiative in order to make it successful. Um, we all know there have been many staffing challenges this year and last year, right? And so that's a good example if we've added staff um, but you know, many of the positions went unfilled for um, you know longer than we would have wanted. Um, having these metrics in place, we can intervene in a in a more um, in a faster way to be able to then still um, enact whatever whatever that initiative was intended to whatever problem that initiative was intended to solve. Awesome, Scott. Same question to you. What was the need this uh, exercise met for your system? Well, I think, you know, that a lot of the same conversation there. Um, for me, I think it also had, you know, a be, being the, the finance officer, you know, it, it was that document, as you just pointed out, there's this national trend of conversation about how investments in education um, work. <laughs> and, um, and that's always been a difficult question for us to answer quite frankly, and, and education has struggled in that area for many years, um, just by the nature of the business that we do. So um, just getting a framework put together, getting that all, um, getting our arms around, okay, we just rushed into this. We, we were all coming off of this, you know, okay, we're opening schools, not opening schools. And in the middle of it, you're like, and plan something that you've never planned before. Um, so, you know, throw the, throw the spaghetti on the wall, get going. And so for us, it was that moment as well to sit back and say, okay, we're kind of into it and some things are working and some things aren't working. What are we going to change? And do we even know uh, if these things are working or not at this point? So uh, it was a pause button, a moment of reflection and uh, a big shout out to ERS for helping us um, just uh, be a thought partner in how to, to structure that conversation because it can be kind of daunting with the, the amount of funds that we're looking at. So, uh, but a lot of the same concepts there of just trying to dive in and really understand where are we at, why are we here, and where do we want to go from there. Great. Um, so we have been able to support uh, over seven districts um, to, to do these reviews and so have pulled out for, for folks some of the big themes here that uh, I, I that are hopefully echoes of um, what I said above, but excited to hear from both of you. Um, what was most insightful for you uh, personally as someone for, responsible for sort of getting to this uh, uh, cohesion across a leadership team, but then also insights uh, that were impactful for the system and leadership teams more broadly. So Scott, why don't you kick us off on that one uh, with what some of your big insights were? Okay, thanks. So. I think for me, there was really two um, things that uh, there was a lot, but the two the big highlights that I want to share, I think, are um, the equity conversation. I mean, that is just forefront uh, for all of us. Um, and I think we always have it in the back of our minds, but we don't always have an idea about how to look at it. And by doing the halftime review, uh, it gave us some clarity on where we're at in the equity conversation. Um, for me, a lot of it, so we have some projects that are capital-based like uh, HVAC upgrades. Um, how does the equity play out in that? Because at the end of the day, um, we need to replace what we need to replace. Well, part of that was just thinking about, okay, well, let's document why we are where we are and let's look at it through the equity lens and see have we maybe just recently addressed those schools? And so maybe we're just not spending in that area for a very specific reason. And at least having that story built out, like it, you know, you, you may have very good reasons for why your, your uh, equity map looks the way it does, but you have to think about like, how am I gonna present this to public? How am I gonna discuss this issue? Um, we had some other initiatives that were kind of school-based and that brings into a whole lot of different kind of conversations about how much uh, they're asking for, how many asked for it, and how do you view that through equity? So really just being able to reflect on that conversation, I think has been a huge positive for us. It hasn't necessarily changed what we're doing. Like I'm not gonna stop fixing the AC at the places I need to fix the AC, but I've been able to go back and research and say, okay, well, the, 
schools that we would identify as some of our highest need schools had already been addressed within maybe the last five years. So I have a good clear answer as to why I didn't go in that direction and I went in another direction, for example. So equity was a big part of our conversation right now and continues to be, of course. I think the part for me that the thing that keeps me up at night is the budget conversation. And it's really in the, the, the realm of, there was a bit of, as we look at the Mesa data, you'll see there's a lot of like, okay, we're not in bad shape. We're kind of on national norms. Like you could have a lot of feel goods walking away from it. But what has kept me um, concerned is that what's really different about ESSER to me is that I think we fall into the trap of starting to think of it like a, a Title I grant or some of our federal uh, state funds that typically uh, we set a plan, we go to spend the plan, we never spend all of it. We have a little bit of carry forward. We move it into that next year. We start all over again. That's our that's our typical budget process, right? Well, ESSER has a, a finite end to it that's not going to allow for that conversation to continue to happen, right? So every, what I'm trying to get everybody here to understand is every time I close a fiscal year with inside ESSER is a year that I cannot pivot any of the maybe ESSER eligible expenses to the grant because that year is closed and moved on. So each year we might be like, okay, we've got a plan. We know where we're spending and we know what we're going to spend. But I keep telling everyone, but I guarantee you, we won't spend it all because we never do. We always have a good plan. We always think we're going to get there, but we never actually get to the full amount. So do we start thinking about budgeting beyond the actual amounts that we have? How do we do it in a way that says, when we get to this, we will we'll have spent all of this because we don't want to leave money on the table for political reasons and because we want to use every resource, right? So that's still the conversation for me that's keeping me up at night is, I know we have a good plan, we feel good about it, but we're still halfway through and it doesn't guarantee that at the end of a year and a half, we're going to have spent everything. Thanks. Um... We'll, we'll pick up that thread, Scott, in our uh, third uh, piece about sort of how you feel like you're managing the budget process this year. Um, so so want to come back to that. Katie, uh, what were, you know, what were some of the big uh, takeaways for you and for the CMS team uh, coming out of the, the halftime conversation? Yeah, so um, two things I want to mention. One, our team grappled a lot with um, one of the things that came out of our ESSER halftime review was that we are actually spending more with our highest need schools. Like they're spending more than our um, than our um, group of schools that are, are not considered highest need. Um, however, that's driven largely by school size and enrollment and not as much by um, you know, specific strategies. And so that was a point of conversation within our um, cabinet team that I think sparked the need to be um, both looking at our current initiatives and how we are um, driving those uh, with, you know, our highest need schools first um, or more, if that makes sense. And um, as we think about new initiatives, really kind of setting us up with that um, talking point with that idea as we go into this next budget cycle and we really do plan for the remaining funds for any unused funds um, from this previous year um, and et cetera, so that we are driving those toward our highest needs um, schools um, and our highest needs students. Uh, the second thing it did for us is it uh, really created a demand among our leaders for follow-up on the initiatives, right? And so um, it gave everyone an opportunity to, like I said, build that shared fact base around what we were doing, why we were doing it, where we are in those um, different initiatives. And so we were able to um, kind of name the items that are that are what we what we're calling our big bets um, and cre it created that demand then for there to be um, consistent follow up going forward so that we can um, track both spending, but also implementation leading indicators. Thanks. Great. Uh, just to draw the parallels between those two answers, I think folks found by setting aside the time to do this conversation, it was uh, familiar data. Like by the time you're actually looking at the data, folks were like, yep, yeah, no, that makes sense based on what we 
did, we allocated uniformly. So therefore dollars are uniform. Uh, we didn't have a strategy uh, to address our highest need schools. And so sure enough, it's not there. And immediately the conversation goes to, uh, well, how do we make sure uh, that we're adjusting moving forward? And so, um, Katie, why don't you pick up where you were leaving off in terms of what are some of those shifts to process uh, and structures that have come out of the conversation um, that you got, you all are implementing for this budget cycle? Yep. Um, so of course we're we're working to make sure that every you know all of our ESSER investments are implemented effectively. Um, but we've also identified these items that we're calling our big bets, and so these are items that we've allocated. Um, there are large allocations, um, things that may be impacted by staffing challenges, things that um, could result in underspend, um, you know, based on just the type of initiative it is, right? It's harder to implement, it takes more infrastructure, et cetera. And so we, what we have in place are um, some key points where we'll bring those back to cabinet um, with an update on implementation and leading indicators. Um, with with the intention not of you know judgment but of continuous improvement on those initiatives but also being able to make really key decisions around some of those um, dollars that might not be spent that you know maybe we allocated 50 million toward a particular initiative but we're coming in below that and so we want to be able to take you know say we're coming in and tracking towards 40 million we want to be able to take that 10 million and put it toward another initiative while we still have time, right? Um, and so that's critically important. And that's why this um, process going forward will be really important for us, um, especially um, as we think about this in the context of this budget season, as we plan for, as Emily mentioned, really our last full school year, which is next school year um, for implementation. Great. Scott, uh, picking up some of the threads, like what are what are some of the ways you are managing your team towards uh, or against the anxieties you have around underspend? Like what are some of the shifts you all are making to your process? You know, I <laughs> wish I had a really good answer for that one, Emily. I think we're in the process of trying to understand that, working with you all looking at this data. Um, you know, we've, we know that we've, you know, it's interesting because part of the data is things you've already tried that maybe you're already walking away from. So uh, a good example for us would be like summer school. Uh, first year, um, summer school was huge, very popular, parents, kids, everybody showing up. Uh, last summer, not so much, right? So in just it, just in a pure, well, let's set it up and do it again and, and, and try to get, you know, some remediation and some opportunities and just in front of children and all of a sudden, you know, the air goes out of the room because um, families are kind of like, yeah, we, we need a break from school. We need a break from everything. So we're, we're just going to take the summer to, to, to do a break. So good for them, right? But not as successful the second time as the first time. So now you're rethinking summer school. Uh, we dipped our toe into uh, uh, tutoring uh, and actually being part of the large consortium, working with ERS and listening to these conversations. We were hearing a lot of stories about how tutoring uh, wasn't working out on, on some big bet uh, districts had made some big bets on tutoring and some of the real challenges they were having with that. We saw a little bit of it. And then to hear that kind of amplified and going, okay, this, this isn't going to work for us either. Uh, the people who are taking advantage of the tutoring aren't really the, the students we're trying to reach. So rethinking, um, how do we do that? You know, at the end of the day, we've focused on kind of first best instruction, instructional coaches, uh, textbook and, and adoptions and better curriculum. We hadn't bought new curriculum in Mesa for over 12 years. So just being able to get some of the basics done has been uh, really important. So um, we're still in that, you know, I, I, I wish I had like, oh, we figured it all out, right? But we, what we've been able to do through the work of the halftime review is to really understand where we're at. And, and now we're just really struggling with that, that point of moving forward. Um, and I feel challenged that even though we have a good plan, um, how do we, as you often talk about, like what's that leading indicator that's telling you that you're still on track and trying to figure out, even though you've got the plan, this is where we struggle as I think as districts in general, we just, we put a plan and we run for a year and 
Maybe the next year we'll look back and see if that worked. And we don't have that kind of time this time. So we're struggling systematically to figure out how to pull those threads and see what it is, where it is, why it is, and then to say, we want to keep going in that direction. Um, this, this process pointed out for us that we have these, um, and, and many districts did this, had some kind of uh, just local control. Here's some money, schools apply for an innovation grant, we called them here, and just think about what you could do differently and how you would educate differently in, the, in these times and these circumstances and with your community. And we didn't get equitable participation. We had, um, you know, some of our high, for high free and reduced asking for a lot of money, but less of the schools in that category overall. So, you know, the spend doesn't look equitable. Um, so there's just a lot of conversation right now as to what to do with all of that. I think we, we've just gotten our heads around what, what we've been able to pull together. And so we're still working through it. Um, let me, let me share. I mean, I, I think Scott, you're, you're understating, I think a little bit, the ways in which you have already responded for this budget cycle. And I think the more frequent reviews of progress data is, is one of them. I've tried to put out here, um, a couple of things we think are particularly important in this budget cycle. And I think this is going to be my last slide and then I'll open it up to, um, general Q&A from the audience. Uh, I think we, we heard from both Scott and Katie um, this uh, added urgency coming out of the review to, to be targeting investments in support of schools with the greatest learning need, whether that's actual dollars, uh, as Katie was talking about, or I think, Scott, in your case, you were talking about these school improvement grants where higher need schools weren't applying at the same rate uh, for them. So like, what are the ways that we can lean in uh, and help uh, those schools find the best use of, of their dollars amidst everything else they have going on? So definitely wanna emphasize that it's never too late to start doing that. And we have to be really careful as the timeline shortens and we target dollars to some schools more than others, which was the intent of our ESSER dollars that we don't create this even bigger uh, cliff for our highest need schools. And so I think I, I would really encourage you to pair that targeting of your ESSER investments with exploring ways to further differentiate your baseline, your general fund staffing and funding formulas uh, in support of that same set of schools. So I think those two are a pair that goes to uh, together. And Emily, I would say, yeah. You're right. And it, maybe it's the finance guy in me, right? I'm always, I'm always a little bit half empty here. But, um, you know, the, what I don't want us to, what I, what I worry about is our complacency. Um, what, we, what, what we analyzed didn't look too bad. Like, we, it, there's a lot of good stuff going on in Mesa. We've got a lot of good programs going in different directions. But overall, we think, you know, benefiting students. But I just don't want us to, to let our, you know, now that we're past halftime and we're back out on the field, it, you know, there's still a half a game to play, right? We can't just say, oh, well, we did really good the first half, so we're good, right? Like we have to stay diligent about uh, continuously looking at this as we finish out this year and plan for next. Because as you said, really, we get one last budget cycle to refocus, rethink, or just get better at what, you know, if we're already winning the game, then let's just keep winning the game. But um, if we stop playing, then we're going to lose again. So, you know, it's, it's just a really challenging. So for me, I just, I, I guess I got that urgency of the coach to make sure the team doesn't come off of halftime, a half asleep and, and, and lose the game <laughs> out, you know, in the fourth quarter. So that, that's, that's where, um, you know, yes, we're strong. We know what we're doing. We know why we're doing it. We've got some good measurements in place, but we have to stay diligent about making sure that uh, we continuously uh, readdress this as we move forward. Great, thanks. Uh, shifting that into what we think are some specific challenges for this budget cycle um, to keep your foot on the gas and, and win the game, uh, as Scott said. I think to, pick, to continue also with my theme of sort of false narratives in the field, I do think you'll hear a lot of folks who are using the word sustainability applying only to, to fiscal sustainability and saying, well, we can't hire staff because uh, you know the, the money goes away. And I think we really wanna uh, 
push for, for sustained student learning to the extent that we have made progress in this first half to accelerate uh, the recovery of um, learning. We want to be able to manage our spending across years uh, and across funding sources in order to sustain what works. And so um, there are some states for which the, the managing across funding sources is incredibly easy, Texas and Florida, where you can sort of shift uh, funds onto general fund. And I think that there are ways in which that's a that can be a really strategic way to sustain something that is having a, a proven impact on student learning. Um, there are other places where that's gonna be more challenging where the regulations are, are uh, stiffer and you're more in, in Scott's world of like, if there's anything left over, it's gonna get sent back, in which case uh, there are some still some creative ways to uh, use different funding sources that have more flexibility. Um, but either way, we, we think that this multi-year view um, to figure out what's working and what needs to sustain is something that needs to be happening in this budget cycle. Um, there's this trick of figuring out uh, how much ESSA revenue we actually want to recognize uh, for next year. This, in, this in, would require a very clear understanding of what will have been spent so far. And then it also requires knowing what your strategy for fiscal year 24 and 25 is going to be with that weird sort of couple of months where you're allowed to spend down, uh, but then after September, it all has to be encumbered for the most part. So uh, getting those two pieces in place to say, here's the revenue we're gonna recognize in 24, feels like a key piece of the puzzle. And then finally, uh, we know we need to start managing uh, the approach to the, the cliff. Um, and we think that to do that, we need to understand how our initiatives are gonna play out over multiple years. And we need to be looking across all of our funding sources to identify potential efficiencies. Um, so it's not that just because something was on ESSER means it has to go away when ESSER ends, right? Like we have this opportunity to take a, a more holistic look across funding sources. And Emily, then, the, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just one example of exactly what you're talking about, and this is the, the budget impact issue of so we have uh, instructional and coaches as one of ours. And so you think about the cliff and you think about trying to get rid of that expense from us or feeling good efficacy to bring it in and, and continue it within Mesa Public Schools. But if you start to phase out of it, then you're opening up budget dollars because you're not spending them when you've had a plan to spend for three years. So that's where I was saying you need to shift something else into that opportunity for ESSER eligibility while you're trying to wean yourself off of uh, this continuous expense that you want to maintain, but need to start to uh, bring into your, your maintenance and operations uh, situation. So that's, that's what I was trying to illustrate of, of that, that, that challenge at the end of what's gonna be eligible to, to replace something you might be phasing into uh, a more permanent sustained uh, financial structure. Exactly, that's great. Uh, and then this last uh, one should be pretty obvious, um, but does require, uh, I think strong advocacy requires uh, good information on what's been working uh, so far. And so all of the work of the halftime review to document, to set up metrics, to figure out the, the cycles of uh, review of those uh, progress measures is gonna be critical for us to do that third one successfully. So with that, I think I will open it up to participants for, for questions. If anyone wants to drop one in the chat or can, can folks come off mute and just chime in? Emily, uh, Sean Gill asked about whether um, either the district folks have had support or not from their states. Uh, and the state agencies about sharing information about the ESSER spend and some of these narrative challenges. Um, we, we've kind of, well, I don't want to be too harsh on our department, but we, we've kind of had the opposite impact. We were actually running into uh, some real challenges with how, what was getting approved or not getting approved. And we actually, uh, being part of the large consortium, uh, working with all, all uh, you wonderful folks over, over these uh, 
group, we were able to connect with some districts who were successful in getting the same things we were asking for, but just using different words and just words matter, right? So we were, we, we were successful in, in working with other districts in other states to figure out how to get through our department of ed, some of the requests that we had. So it's been kind of the opposite. Our, our department has been very, very in a box as to how these monies can be spent. And that has created some real challenges to spending the money. Um, for for a simple answer, um, we have we've we've communicated with the public, but um, not necessarily like through our state or in comparison to other districts in the state. So um, we do keep our board um, updated, and those are public meetings. Um, we did some work as we were building our plans to engage various um, existing public groups and get feedback and things of that nature. Um, but that's been um, district driven. If I could just add one thing, um, some folks may run into, um, in terms of um, Emily's, you know, uh, myth busting, you may run into a myth um, that, you know, these, your plans have been approved by the federal government and, and you know, you can't, you can't unwind that. And um, I just want to flag that the U.S. Department of Ed has described local ARP plans as that they should be, quote, living documents, end quote. Um, and so it may be that folks in your state, um, in your state agency or else like sort of try and hold that up as a, you know, boogeyman, um, I encourage you to push through and the value that you're hearing from these two folks and from Emily having worked with other districts on the value of doing reviews and adjusting along the way, um, I think can't be understated and, and federal approval of, of all things should not uh, be something that gets in the way. Kind of on, on that same note, we made eight amendments to our um, ESSER three plan last year. Um, last last year alone, eight amendments. Um, those do have to go through like a formal process with our state, which um, is uh, technically and logistically challenging. Um, but um, they're they're not like putting up barriers, if that makes sense. Um, so just to to kind of reiterate what Dan was saying, our plan has been very. I think for us, it's it's been very, they've been very strict about what they're approving, but I will say the process has been pretty uh, uh, good in the sense we have a specialist, we can communicate um, what we think our changes are going to be, they, they can, re they react to that before we put in a formal request. So we're getting some real time feedback and that's been positive because uh, we we definitely are experiencing a living document in Arizona. And I think our Department of Education is, is living into that as, as they're allowing that process to be continuous and ongoing. So that, that, that's a positive for, for us. Yeah. I'm going to practice wait time here on the questions uh, <laughs> and so know that we will stop what we're doing uh, if one of you has something you'd rather uh, jump in here with but I guess for closing Katie and Scott uh, if there are other districts out there thinking uh, gosh that sounds like something I should do I'm not sure I have the capacity to do it or you know like is it <laughs> too late. Uh, do you have advice uh, for those system leaders who are uh, thinking about heading into uh, a halftime review at this moment? Uh, work with ERS. They're fantastic. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, in, in all seriousness, so um, Emily and the, the ERS team just did a fantastic job with um, helping us to you know, take what was a lot of data and make sense of it, ask the right question, structure the conversation. Um, so that's been incredibly helpful um, uh, to us. Um, but, you know, if you are considering um, doing this, I think taking the time to do it, which was one of my concerns initially, um, taking the time to do it is very much worth it um, because the reality is uh, these, you know, we 
we are getting down to the the end here, right? In terms of plans and being able to turn new things on or being able to turn the ship um, with current initiatives. And so um, in my opinion, it is very much worth the time, energy, effort um, to, to do sort of this ESSER halftime step back, um, halftime review, um, as if you're, if you're considering it. Scott, don't, don't answer the question in the same way, please. And Katie, I might make you come back. But if like without extra surge capacity with limited time, like what are the pieces that you would say are most impactful? Scott, do you? So uh, for me, I think the, the ref take the time to reflect on, again, not what, um, so again, there's this huge pressure for, for this fiscal transparency. There's kind of a national agenda conversation going on about, and it's just always been very difficult to explain the complexity of educational investment, right? There's just a lot of moving parts. So I would say, think about what you want your narrative to look like in, in, a, in a year and a half, because it you, you may not have the... Ex the graphs may not look pretty. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. But it, you got to be able to explain them, um, and you got to you get. And I would say start now creating the capacity. I think it's one of the things we're just getting going in May is trying to create the capacity with even our governing board to understand that narrative because they're going to get the questions. We're going to get the questions. We don't even know what all the questions are going to be yet. But there's this general. How do you equate dollars and outcomes with kids? It's always been a challenge, still a challenge. ESSER is going to be a challenge, but be ready to tell your story about, uh, try to take it beyond, finance guy, take it beyond the numbers so that you can explain the impact and how, one of the things we've struggled in Mesa with is the idea that, um, you know, loss of learning. The kids didn't learn, lose any learning. They just didn't get it. <laughs> you know? So they didn't lose something, but there's this construct of they have to be at this place at this time in, in their in their educational cycle, right? That That's what we talk about is that they're not, you know, test scores aren't high enough. Kids aren't uh, far along, far enough along in, in, in their grade levels or whatever from, from the pandemic. So how do you address that narrative about what it is in the long term of a, of a student's career as a as a K twelve student that's going to get them to a successful graduation. That I mean, you want to you want to think about how you're going to have that conversation with your community, with the press, with your board, and it may not just be numbers, but the analysis, the most analysis you can do, the best you can do it. I know some folks have really limited resources you know, try to put it in some con context that has, you know, the graphs and all that so that folks can see it, but then have the narrative tied to it. And I think that's where we, we might have some of the really good graphs right now, but we're still working on what that narrative is going to be and how that's going to play out. Katie, did you want to? Yeah, the only thing I would, I would add to that, 100% um, agree. I'd say if you're going to do nothing else as a part of your ESSER halftime review, identifying what we're calling our big bet initiatives. So initiatives that are, you've got a lot of money allocated toward them um, and they're harder to implement, right? Like they're not just a simple, oh, we're paying out a bonus as Emily mentioned earlier. Identifying those and having like a set cadence for how you're tracking, not just spend, but like implementation leading indicators. I would say those, that would be my advice if you're doing you know, not sort of the whole ESSER halftime review, but um, just to get clear on those, because I think that allows you to then um, put some things in place if you need to change implementation on those big bets, um, pull funds back away from those and put them towards something else if something is coming in under budget or, you know, not working, et cetera. Um, so I think it gives you the most information for sort of the least amount of time. Great. Uh much more actionable than the first one. <laughs> Thanks, Kitty. <Keedy. laughs> okay, uh, we are hoping that the resources we have online are a, a, a guide to, to doing this um, independently, um, both a, a PDF and an Excel uh, tool to try and track progress. 
Um, I think I'll turn it back uh, to Dan um, to close us out here. Yeah, first of all, huge thank you uh, to Emily, Katie, and Scott um, for the work you're doing and for taking the time to share it, particularly to Katie and Scott coming off of a holiday weekend and, and um, presenting our webinar when you've got a thousand things. Um, and the same goes for our attendees. Um, this has been a great conversation. We hope that um, everyone has to go through their own process, right? But we hope that hearing the stories of Cheryl Mecklenburg and Mesa Public Schools, um, that you get a sense of the kinds of insights and, and um, adjustments uh, that your team might be able to do if you, if you carve out the time um, and do a thoughtful uh, review of how things are going. Um, as I mentioned, we are continuing to do work with ASA um, in, in pursuit of helping districts um, with all of this and, and answering that essential question we started with. And to help us meet your authentic needs, we need to know what's working, we need to know what's getting in your way, and we need to know, know what would help. Um, there's a link there um, that Ellie just dropped in the chat as well. Um, we always take suggestions and questions. If there's something that you think would be helpful to, the, to you, your team, or the field, um, we really want to know so that we can consider um, creating it for you um, or arranging a webinar like this where some of your, your key questions get answered. Um, ERS will actually be with us at um, the National Conference on Education, ASA's annual conference, uh, doing a session um, along with some, some similar kind of content um, to, to this and on the need for continuous improvement. Um, so please look for us in the program for NCE. Um, and mostly just thanks for spending some time with us. Have a great day. Big thank you to Scott and Katie. Uh, really appreciate you. you taking the time and sharing your experiences.